Welcome to Goldfish on Games and Cover Disc Face Off. This is where the plastic meets the drive, as we check out the discs from May 1993. This includes Amiga Action, the one for Amiga and Amiga Format. Fight! First up is Amiga Action, with three discs, each with having two titles, so there's a lot to get through. And first up is a game we've just seen recently, it's Super Frog! And I do like it when a demo is unique or customised to the magazine. As we can see there's big Amiga Action logos everywhere. Along with big LucasAid adverts as well, which I don't remember being in the final game, I thought it was just the bottles. And if you've not heard of Super Frog before, it's a Euro platformer, in which you control a man who got turned into a frog, who then gains superpowers by drinking the aforementioned energy drink, LucasAid. You complete levels by collecting enough coins to open up the exit, and this one is set in the Ancient Zone, which is one of the later ones in the game. So be prepared for a slightly more difficult level than you might be expecting. But all the abilities have been included, like the Destructo Spud and the Wings. And I think it's even got some unique sound effects that never made it into the final game as well. I don't remember it shouting out, Super Frog! And between that and having the music, this is actually a pretty decent demo. And we go from one platformer to another in Chuck Rock 2, a game that I've previously enjoyed and reviewed which makes this demo quite special as it's a brand new one set in the wacky waterfall zone. A zone that in the final game only had a single level, so seeing this is quite cool. And for those who haven't seen that review yet, you take the role of Chuck Jr, a baby with a big club. And he's on a quest to save his dad from Gary Gritter. Wow, that's a reference that's aged poorly. This is a relatively simple platforming affair, with Junior just needing to make his way to the exit. But he has to use his club to bash his way through anything that would get in his way. And there are points and health pickups all through the level for you to grab as well. All the baddies from the main game are here, including those spitters as well as the sharks. But they all go down pretty easily with a whack with the club. And they've even included the water slides. And they've got all this happening while there's some nice water effects going on in the level, in both the background and the foreground as well. It's a shame there's no sound effects, as the main game actually has them along with the music, but uh, I think we can forgive them for that. Because, well, look, when you get to the end, you even have the boss from the first zone. You can't actually hurt him, but he's there, and the game will then just restart. And we're on to the second disc, which has an action favourite, just dumping us to a command prompt where we have to type in the name. And if we type in Dizzy, then we get Easter Extravaganza starring Dizzy aka a reskinned fast food dizzy with a few less levels. Action were really big on their customised games this month, weren't they? This is a very different dizzy game to what most people would think about, as it's really closer to Pac-Man than that puzzle solving adventure. But there are less pellets for you to eat, and said pellets also move around the map, and they aren't really dots at all here, as they're all Easter themed items. Decorated eggs, chickens, chocolate eggs, and what I'm guessing are hot cross buns. But there are also nasties on the go as well, which you have to avoid. And telling them apart can be a little bit tricky at times with everything moving. So 
so you really have to be on your toes. As some of those baddies do move faster than you do. If I remember my history, the original game was knocked up over a weekend, so I don't expect this version took them much longer than that to do as well. But it was cool that they managed to include various pickups for you to find. If you can catch them, obviously, and these include speed ups, downs, destroy all the baddies, become invisible, all the usual things. So if you do spot them, do try and hunt them down, because they can be really useful. The next demo is Sink or Swim, a game that I've known of, but never really played. So I was looking forward to trying out this demo. And it seems like many of the other games that we've already seen, these levels are either new, or they're from much later on in the game so they can take a little while for you to work out how to complete them. And they don't give you much time either. Like in this first level, the dim passengers, and I swear that's what the manual calls them, don't even have enough time to make it to the first ladder. So you already need to know how to deploy the raft to save them, and that's done via the spacebar. And with that, you can then go off and try and find where the exit is. And if you think it's that nice one out in the open, nope, that's a trick, as the one you really want is hidden behind this box. And to get that you need to set off a bomb to get rid of it. And so you'll have to work out how to do that as well. Some extra instructions would have been nice. So the objective, if you've not already worked it out already, is to get the dims to the exit but they don't act with anything close to logic. They aren't as smart as lemmings here, as they'll get to the top of a ladder and then either go left or right. It's almost completely random. So you'll end up having to work around them and hoping for a bit of luck that they'll go in the right direction before the water level rises. And the final disc for action starts with Super Cauldron, which has a nice little animated title screen. And it seems to be a remaster of a game called Cauldron, an 8-bit game that I have absolutely no experience with. So I have no idea how good this compares. The movement itself seems pretty decent as you can slide down these hills and throw rocks. And if you find the broomstick, then you can fly around for a while as well. And I have to say, it's all looking really nice. There's lots of detail and nice touches going on, with the lightning and those rippling bushes. But in playing the demo, you might feel a little bit lost. As you fly around this level, that wraps back on itself, and you just sort of, and you just throw rocks at baddies, and that's about it. There doesn't really seem to be any objective. And that's because in the full game, you have to find hidden entrances, which are behind the trees. But in the demo, there's nothing. So it really does make for a really confusing demo, really, as you just don't know what you're meant to be doing. Even if they had just one of those hidden zones, I think it really would have helped. Or there could have at least been some indication that you could not complete the demo. And after an all but in name Pac-Man clone with Dizzy, we get an actual Pac-Man clone in the form of Pac-Man Deluxe. A game that's definitely put its looks out in front, as we get some very large sprites for all of the characters, which has shrunken down the game grid just a touch. And just look at that face of Pac-Man. I don't think that's someone who's living their best life. But this is very much Pac-Man through and through. You've got to eat all the pellets and you can go on to the next level. There's power pills that'll turn the ghosts blue and allow you to eat them. And when you do finish the level, well, you get this fancy zoom effect as well. Each of the levels that I've played have had their own maze designs, which is cool. But it all feels a little bit cramped due to the size of everything. It's a very well put together PD game. 
with some great presentation, but I do feel their priorities might have been in the wrong place. Next we have Amiga Format, and with just a single disc and no productivity software, it's a bit of a light month for them. And first up is possibly one of the most important computer animations of all time, as it's the animation that directly led to the creation of Lemmings. It's a looping animation that's not very long, but it does show some interesting traps. As well as how the animation style improved, as you can see a simple walk, as well as one with more life in it, stood next to each other, right next to that hungry looking clown. Ugh. It's one of those really interesting bits of history, and it's extremely cool that they included it in this magazine. Next up decided to mix the three things that kids all love. Text adventures, maths, and edutainment. That's right, it's the very yellow and blue demo of Fraction Goblins. And in this game you find that your pencil case has been ransacked by a bunch of goblins that you were visiting. And you now have to go out and try and get everything back. As well as finding the key that will unlock your pencil case. You do this by travelling north, south, east, west, and taking and getting objects. But along the way, those fraction goblins will show up and ask you some possibly tricky maths problems. And if you get it right, then you get to continue on your way. Get it wrong, and they will take one of the items that you've collected. In the demo, it's all about multiplying fractions. And in the full game, you've got the whole range of adding, subtracting, and dividing. So if you want to practice those other parts, then you're going to have to buy the full game. But in this one, I will say that some of the questions were a bit easier than others. And that the images are a little bit crude and could have been done on the previous generation. And I'm not sure they really thought about the colour choices for that background and the text either. But it is enough for the type of game that this is, as it's a simple but effective game that even made me stop to have to think about some of the answers. Charlie Chimp is next, which was a winner of the Games Master Make a Game in Amos competition, which is pretty cool. Let's go! The game is a take on a classic gameplay style, in which you have to walk over every tile to change its colour but you have to do it multiple times if you want to finish the level, so that's their twist. Oh, and you'll also need to take out these supposedly mutated creatures as well. As this is a world where disasters have struck, and you have to save them with your magic pot of paint. So they aren't really lovable little creatures, they have been mutated by the acid rain and the pollution in the oceans. Honestly, that's what the instructions say. But taking out those mutated animals can take quite a few hits. And each time they get whacked, they will go flying across the screen. So it's not a quick job either. And you'll have to do everything within the time limit, so it can be very tricky. But the monsters will drop items when they finally explode. That can really help you out. And if you do run out of time, then an acid cloud will show up and start raining down acid rain on your head. So you better be careful. Let's go. And to make everything trickier, some of those blocks have a symbol on them. And when they get painted, they will trigger an action. That might be as simple as pushing you around, dropping you through a floor, or making you bounce. Or it might just make a random burp or fart sound effect. <laughs> fart. The movement is a little loose, and it can take a little bit to get used to, as is the same with the collision detection, which also feels a little bit touchy. 
and some of those deaths, I swear, were not my fault. And if you're particularly good, you might come up against the boss, and that's where the collision detection will really hit you. Let's go. I do feel this is the area of the game that could have done with the most work, as there's lots of nice things about this game. And I'm not just meaning those fart and burping sound effects. It is quite a cool little title, as you have different weapons, and you even have a rope that you can use to make new ladders with. So, all in all, definitely a fun game, and you can see why it won the competition, and then got a proper release. And finally for the magazine, we have one of the best PD games ever made. It's Atoms! Yes, if you've seen any of my homebrew titles, you'll finally see where that game came from, as this is the original one that I played. Now, it might only support four players and have no AI, but that doesn't mean it's not great. Because I used to try and get everyone I knew to play against me on this, as I enjoyed it that much as the level of polish in this game is amazing. If you've not heard me talk about Atoms before, then shame on you for not watching any of my dev videos, but the idea is that you take it in turns to put Atoms on the board. They can either be placed in empty squares or on top of your own. If you stick too many on a square, then they'll go critical and explode, at which point they'll take over the squares directly around it. And you can use this to take over your opponent's Atoms and that can cause chain reactions that can get really large and then take over the entire board. It's a really fun game with some lovely animations and some wonderful music. And it's obviously a game that has stuck with me over the years. And in coming back to this, I realised that they actually included the full source code for the game. Now, I never read it back in the day as I didn't understand assembly, but if I did, that would have been amazing to read up on. All in all, as I said at the beginning, the best PD game ever made. And finally, we have the one for Amiga, with three discs, six games, but two repeated ones. First, we have The Lost Vikings, a game that's possibly more well known for its console releases than this one. And for a demo, this is quite full featured, as it has the regular menu and even the full animated intro. So this is very obviously based on a near finished game, as it even starts with the first few levels from the game which is nice as it gives you this real idea of how the game will play and progress, as this is the type of game that you really need to learn how to play it, as you have to switch between the three lost vikings and use their various abilities to get you to the exit. It's a genre that I actually quite enjoy, the single player co-op. But one of the downsides of playing it on the Amiga is that with the single button joystick, you have to use a whole bunch of extra keyboard keys to be able to do all the different commands, such as switching between the Vikings, using buttons, or even using your inventory items. So it can feel a little clunky in places. It is a fun demo with quite a few levels as well, so this is really something you get stuck into and really enjoy. The second disc has a few games we've already seen, in the form of Sink or Swim and Super Cauldron, and both are exactly the same demos that we saw in Amiga Action, so there really isn't any point in looking at them again, unfortunately. So we move on to the only new demo on this disc, which is Legends 2 Son of the Empire. Now I'd never even heard of or played Legends before, so I had no idea what to expect in coming to this game, and it seems it's a form of RPG that initially has you going around this town, talking to people, and trying to sell and buy items. It's all very much standard RPG fare. 
but it feels like the real core of this game is when you enter a dungeon. As it switches to this isometric view, with you now controlling the four main characters of the game. You can just click somewhere in the map and your selected character will walk there. You can switch between them by using the icons on the left and you've got various other things going on around you as well. It's a really nice system as you can move around and the other characters will get out your way. You can then look at what's on the floor, take items and all that type of stuff, all from this screen. And when you do move into a next room, they even move together, which is really nice, as I was expecting to have to move each person in turn. The combat also seems quite interesting, as you can set the party members to auto fight, and then you take control of one of them and then do it manually. Which I found using the wizard to be quite cool, as he has a whole list of spells, which I have absolutely no idea what any of them do. But randomly clicking on them, or using the number keys, I could see some very fancy effects, and I think occasionally hurting or helping my teammates, I'm not sure which. It's definitely an intriguing game, and one I wasn't able to get into too much, but I could easily imagine me putting lots of time into this back in the day, as this looked really quite deep and interesting. Next up is a game with a slightly clunky name. It's Ancient Art of War in the Skies. A World War I flight sim with a very, very high level of presentation and polish. From the menus where you move this pencil around, to selecting your mission and even getting some backstory to what's going on. And then you have the loading screens as well. Now initially I was expecting this to be a flight sim with its name and all. So the main game screen confused me slightly, but that's because it's not just a flight sim, it's also a strategy game, where you have various airfields on your side of the map, and you can then build up squadrons and send them out to do missions. And what those missions are, are up to you. Do you want to intercept an enemy to stop it from attacking you? Or do you want to head off and do a bombing run? And in the full game, you'd be able to take over these dogfights and bombing runs. But in the demo, it's just the war map. So this is a really interesting title, if one that moves a little bit slower than I might like. I don't know if this got a PC port or runs better on an A1200, that's something I'd have to check out. But on a stock machine, it feels a little bit jerky. But because there is something there, I might have to return to it and give it a better look, as it's quite cool seeing things going on on the map with the fighting going along the front lines, and seeing them move as the time ticks on. And the final game is Boulder's Grove, which I'm sure you're all shocked to hear is a Boulder Dash clone. But what is slightly surprising is that it requires Kickstart 2 to run. That means the Amiga 500 users are mostly left out. It's far more likely that Amiga 1200s can't run these demos or need to do something to get the games to work instead. Boulder Dash isn't my favourite classic game, so I can't say how closely this follows it. But it does move well enough and it's got some nice little touches, like the rocks and rings spinning as they fall. It also feels like something out of an 80s action movie, with everything exploding if you mess up, or if you manage to take out one of those baddies. What I don't like is the very strict time limit. Even from the first level, if you're not legging it to the exit, you're not going to make it in time. And it seems that there are quite a few levels in the game, with some cool ideas that I spotted later on. But overall, it's definitely not the type of game for me. But what is for me though, is something that they also included, which was a level editor. And for once, I don't have to enter in some special code or do a trick to get to it. It's right there on the cover disc menu. And it's a really nicely done GUI based one as well. You just select the tile you want from along the bottom and then just draw it on the screen. It's really quick and easy. And to be completely honest, I'd most likely get far more fun out of this than the main game. But that's just me.
And with that, I feel we've come to the end. So all that's left is the rankings, and this was another difficult month to sum up. In last place, I feel it's... one for Amiga. It's not a bad addition at all, and there were some fun and interesting games. It's just slightly lacking against... Amiga Action, which is in second place. Again, some really fun games, but it had some unique content going on, which put it just ahead for me, as it's great finding something that you couldn't get anywhere else. Which means Amiga Format is in first place, and yes, it's simply down to Atoms, sorry not sorry. It's one of my favourite games, so how could I not give it top billing? This is normally where I'd say if you disagree with me, let me know down in the comments, but this time, I don't want to know. It's not always about the quantity of games, it's about the quality, and obviously my opinion as well. But if you really want to tell me I'm wrong, go for it. And until next time, I was the Goldfish, that was my final answer and I'm sticking to it, and this was Goldfish on Games. Thank you for watching this Cover Disc Face Off. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please consider checking out some of the other episodes in the series, as I've done quite a few already. Or if you really enjoyed it, and you can't wait for the next one, then there's a few buttons just below the video. So until then, goodbye, and I hope to see you again soon.